well. I work with all the youth across the state and I am organizing this in um, collaboration or with the help of um, the Education Justice Coalition, particularly Alisa Shen, who has helped so much with outreach. Thank you to Vermont Developmental Disabilities Council, BCDR member organizations, UVM Center for Disability and Community Inclusion, and the Vermont Statewide Independent Living Council, who helped fund VCDR's disability awareness event this year. So the unique thing about our program today is basically because um, we are having the youth voice this time in the Disability Awareness Day. You know, we always have it, but uh, we never had the, uh, the youth, but this is a very unique time for us to have the, the youth that have gone through some advocacy skills and strategies and are able to advocate for themselves. And now they are at the level of advocating, advocating for uh, systemic changes at the state level, which is a great piece for us. Um, please, uh, you are reminded to share your ideas or your comments in the chat box as we have already started. Captioning is available as well as ASL interpreters. Uh, please let Stephanie or Alisa know if you have any technical problems. Feel free to message them directly in the chat box. And if anything, um, yeah, any problem you have. Please note that we are recording the meeting and a transcript is being generated. So we will be able to share the conversation with folks able to join us tonight. And it will be very helpful to the interpreters if you will keep your videos or um, yeah, your videos turned off, unless you are speaking. We want to be sure that the interpreter shows up on the recording. On the other hand, uh, a bit of house housekeeping. Stephanie will embed the stream text captioning link in the chat box. We are saving that uh, we will have a jam board and we will have this saved and we will be working with the youth organizers to create a short booklet to share with participant uh, partners and policy makers after this. And then um, I just want to say thank you again to the leaders who came together to create this workshop, Jacob, Salilo, Shiloh, uh, Benny, and yeah, the rest who have been part of this journey together. After the panel, uh, we or a few people have been asked to share their responses among the gathering. Also uh, questions and ideas and comments are welcome in the chat box, as I said already. Uh, without much I do now, I would like um, our one of the panelists to to introduce what we we have as the introduction to you and exercise a short exercise to do with the jam board so that we know where we are. Salilo. Do you mind repeating that last message there? It's been cutting in and out a little bit for me. Are you, oh, are you, that's as for after the panel. Are you are you um, wanting people just to understand what the jam board is? If... Yeah. Okay. So um, after we uh, after the students answer some questions, we're going to be doing a jam board and I'll send the link in the chat box when the time is here. Um, but for those of you who don't know how to use the jam board, you're just going to click on the link and it's going to open you up um, to a page and you'll be able to see everything everybody else is writing. And on the left, there's like a toolbar and there's one shaped like a sticky note and you'll just click on that write your response to the prompt and um you'll be able to see your answer alongside everybody else so it's a really nice tool for brainstorming and for collaborating with ideas and so yeah i can also give another um quick intro to how to use it when the time is 
upon us. But yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Salailo. So the focus of this workshop emerged from two panel sessions that conversations and uh, sharing individual story that uh, led to discovering a unity of purpose to see change happen and to invite others to join the conversation. Three of the students who helped plan the session are on tonight's panel, and one will be speaking after the panel. Now we'll have the panel um, self-introduction. Can we have the panelists introduce themselves? Uh, Grace? Hi, um, my name is Grace. Uh, Shiloh Hope Grace, I respond to any of them. They're all first names. Um, my preferred pronouns are male, female, gender neutral, really don't care. I'm pretty gender fluid. Um, I'm a sophomore college student majoring in engineering. Prior to VCIL, I also worked with YDP Development Program and NEYC New England Coalition. Um, and I, back in high school, I was certified by GLSEN, which is the Gay, Lesbian, Straight Education Network. Um, so yeah, that's my story. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Salilo, would you like to introduce yourself, please? Our second sure. panelist. <laughs> my name is Salilo. I am 17 years old and I am a junior at Champlain Valley Union High School. I've been, um, my pronouns are she, her, hers. I've been working with a few people on this panel in the Act One working group and also in the Education Justice Coalition and a few, um, yeah. And so I think that's <laughs> all I can say about myself, but. <laughs> Thank you, Salailu. Our third panelist is Benny. Is Benny? on the list. I haven't seen Benny, but uh, the next panelist is Jacob. Is Jacob on the list, I guess? Jacob, um, can you introduce yourself? Uh, yeah. Um... Hi, my name is Jacob Peak. Um, I am 14 years old. I go to U32 Middle and High School in eighth grade. And um, yeah. Okay, thank you all. Please um, let me know if uh, Benny arrives because I can see him <laughs> among the people. Um, yeah, so we will go straight forward to Grace with our first question. Uh, what stands out for you as the biggest attitude, not or social or academic obstacle in your school? Um, for me, it's really just the lack of chances given to people of disabilities. Um, I myself am dyslexic and suffer from CPTSD. Um, complex PTSD. That means that I can struggle with a lot of things and even shut down from certain amounts of stress. That means that I was not given the same opportunities as the average students. So um, this means that I wasn't allowed certain classes, groups, programs that maybe the average student without disabilities could have had. And a lot of my friends have been facing that with physical disabilities um, because they supposedly aren't able to get to the classes on time and the schools don't want to offer them um, reasonable accommodations. Hmm. Thank you for that. If I should go on a little, what resources and support have made a real and positive difference for you? Um, for me personally, it's, just a few extra minutes to get to class. I personally needed that back in high school because I do have a um, hip disability. My hip dislocates every once in a while. Um, so I did need a few extra minutes to get to class because I couldn't really rush to class every single day. 
Um, and it was really amazing in high school. I was given my junior and sophomore year, my second junior actually, um, the same accommod the same uh, opportunities as other students, and it allowed me to amazingly excel and show just how well I could actually do. Thank you, Grace. And if I should ask you, what would you most likely to see changed in this your journey or in this your personal experiences? If you want to change something, what will that be? Changed is those same opportunities that I got my second junior year and my sophomore year provided to the lower grade students. Um, hmm. So really just schools thank you offering, oh sorry really just school same offering same opportunities to the disabled youth that they offer to the average youth. thank you grace salilo so i think so <laughs> yeah <laughs> sorry <laughs> What stands out for you as the biggest attitude now or social or even academic obstacle as you uh, transition in your journey in education? Yeah, I think I have to kind of repeat a little bit of what um, Shiloh said because I did have and I'm still having a pretty similar experience to her around um having, you know, inaccessible environments where I don't succeed as well as other students be put, um, being represented as my value as a student instead of a reflection of their inability to accommodate to the services I need. And so I feel like that's been the biggest thing that I do that I can succeed and that I can do, you know, harder classes and the classes I am most interested in. But in order for me to succeed and to do my best work, I do need to collaborate with the teachers and everyone and make sure that my accommodations are met and respected. And so I think I would have to repeat kind of the sentiment of um, Shiloh's comment. Mm. When you say you need to collaborate, what do you mean by that? Um, I think it's, I think it's a process of the teacher meeting the student where they are and the student meeting the teacher where they are, even though we shouldn't have to meet them because like, it's just, it, it sometimes it, it's never black and white and it changes in the social structure of the classroom and the teaching style of the educator. And so um, that's what I mean by collaborate because I do think it is, it needs to be individualized to like the circumstances. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that insight. So when we talk about resources and support, what resources have made a real and positive difference? And, or in other words, what resources do you need to be available that needs to be available and they are not there for you? I think the biggest pattern I've found when I, I feel most unheard and I feel most disrespected is when it's like services are offered condescendingly like you have that you are inherently n not as able as everybody else when in reality, it's the opposite that the environment won't accommodate to the needs you have. And so I found like I, I have had some 504 coordinators who 
were unable to to work with me and in those situations I've found that my allies are are the people who don't condescend to me who see my humanity and like work with me to demand better standards from my educators and that can be anybody from you know just teachers I'm close with to even a faculty who don't necessarily work with the students in an educational sense but who are there as like custodial people or but in any sort of capacity. And so I, I find that in those situations, it's the people who don't condescend and it's the people who are willing to advocate for you, even if it's not their ad, uh, even if it's not their job to do so. Hmm. Yeah, you touch base on a very interesting point, having an ally. Uh, that is another strong piece that we we normally look sight of, especially in advocacy. We always need allies to support us. So thank you for mentioning that. What will you most likely see change? I think, if we should give you the chance, yeah. <laughs> I think I would like to see the culture shift in schools. Um, mm. I think I would like to see people's being evaluated in a less standardized sense in a, and in a more individual sense where you honor where the student is coming from and how hard they are working to be present in your space and mm. you celebrate them for doing that and you you also value them as like a learner and as a human and mm. i feel like it's really hard because sometimes we lose sight of that especially i feel like as the classes get harder and the grades get higher because we move more and more towards like standardized um, learning that doesn't honor the diversity of like s students and so I think that's the biggest um, thing I would like to change and I know that's very general but I feel like that's the pattern I find <laughs> yeah thank you so much our third panelist um, is Jacob so Jacob, um, if I should ask you the same question, what stands out for you as the biggest challenge or ob obstacle uh, as you journey in your transition? The biggest challenge for me is really, there's quite a few actually. Um, one is the big one. Uh, staying organized and because there's like a lot of moving to several different classrooms and picking up and having to find the right folder and papers mm. um and yeah like also turning things in on time mm. would you like to share a little bit about um your declaration also in terms of inaccessibility that you you are looking for in the school system uh, as a child on IEP program? Um, yeah, um, so at the elementary school I went to, it was ac accessible because it was only one floor. They did have a button, like the door button but it was rarely ever turned on so when we really needed it um it wasn't turned on like ever so it and it was like tough to hold the door because in a wheelchair they're so wide you have to like stand behind the door while holding it open mm. Mm. 
So what resources or support do you think will be helpful or you need to, to work um, fruitfully? Um, I think definitely keeping the button turned on 24 seven uh, because you never know when like say um, we sometimes have to go we go to an open house for my little siblings and it's not turned on so maybe having it turned on for like all specific events or if they know that someone in a wheelchair is coming mm, that's a good one day and would you like to change something about that personally if we give you the chance what would you do Me, I would definitely um, make it a lot more accessible for everyone. Thank you so much. Alisa, uh, we heard about the, some of these injustices um, shared by this student and your um, position as one person that we are collaborating with uh, in terms of education, social education, and social justice, what do you have to say uh, talking about these particular things that these panelists have shared? Alisa? Hey, I don't know if I popped up. Are you there? Sorry about that. I was my sister's here. I got a little distracted. Did you want me to share a little bit about the coalition? Yes, yes. Uh, we have heard from the student about how they are facing some of discrimination and injustice in the educational system. So we would like you to share a little bit more. Yeah, how about sure. Um, yeah, just building on what the student said, the Education and Justice Coalition of Vermont um was founded and we passed an ethnic studies bill at the state level and we're a really kind of multi-dimensional coalition so we have students of color indigenous folks students in, with disabilities lgbtq plus students and we're all kind of coming together to try to make the schools more accessible more just more inclusive we think about curriculum we think about discipline and we take an education organizing approach. So that just means we build relationships and try to make change locally. Um, and I'll put my um, contact info in the chat. I'm happy to chat with people. And we're currently working on a campaign called Beyond COVID Recovery. Um, and that's looking at all the COVID funding and money that's coming in and making sure that it's really supporting um, students with disabilities and students of color. Um, and yeah, someone said more transparency. That part's really important. And so we're pushing for more transparency in the funding to make sure that it's really gonna support students. Thank you very much, Alisa. Um, somebody actually also um, shared in our questions or in, in registration question um, about what advice would you give to uh, yourself as a child in elementary school. And this actually goes to all the three panelists. So I will start from Grace. What advice would you give to yourself as a child in elementary school? If you should look back today. Okay, so you gotta understand I was a very ahead of my time child. Um, I was very smart for being a little kid. <laughs> um, maybe a little too smart. <laughs> but uh, I, I'd probably tell her because at the time I, I was very shy and it was kind of depressing me. So I'd probably tell her just fight for your right to access knowledge. I was definitely, I, I loved learning. You deserve the chance to take whatever classes you desire because I was kept out of certain classes even back then um like there was a lot of uh classes for elementary school kids in my area that I was not allowed to take because of my disabilities um and most importantly just follow your passion even as this little kid you're still allowed to advocate for yourself since 
I, I know your parents won't do it. <laughs> so <laughs> show the world that you are not just a broken piece of trash. Show them that your bumps and cracks are filled with gold. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Salilo, if you should go back a little bit, what would you tell that child in elementary school? I would probably say to value yourself as much as you value others, because I think I kind of went the opposite way. I didn't start with self-advocacy. I started with advocating for my friends and being really enraged by the injustices they faced. And eventually, pretty recently, I started extending that same empathy to myself. So I think I would go back and just say that you deserve to be fought more as much as you are fighting for others. And it's okay to ask for help. And that when you are unable to meet people's standards, it's not a reflection on you because the environment you are operating in is inherently unjust and not fit to accommodate somebody with your background. Mm. Mm. Thank you. Jacob, I know you are so young, but you have journeyed so fast in self-advocacy and the level at which you have come, I know you are um, matured in mind in terms of leading the self-advocacy group in your school. I know you are recruiting some people even for me. So if you should tell them something about the importance of self-advocacy to you, what will you tell them? So I would probably tell them that it's like you can fight for yourself if there's something that you need. Like speak out if you need something to like access something or learn better in schools or anything really. Thank you. So now we will ask Salilo to lead us through the Jamboard activity. And then after that, we will come back to the audience. Uh, we will send uh, ask you to also play your role and by sending messages or comments, questions, we will come back to you after the Jamboard activity. This activity, as I have already explained, uh, will, will come out as a booklet, which we will definitely um, share. But the main focus for this is to make sure that we make some systemic changes. So it will serve as a way of uh, a call to action for us as advocates. So as you can see in the chat box, yes, Alilo, I will hand over the mic to you now. Hi. Um, so if you could please click on the link I just sent in the chat, that is the link to the Jamboard that is being projected on the screen right now by Alyssa. And this prompt is meant to kind of welcome you into the creative thinking process of trying to come up with some solutions um, for the problems that we just outlined. And it's really important um, that you don't limit yourself and put constraints on yourself because it's really easy in that initial process to immediately undermine um, your own ideas because it isn't possible, but we want to create a space where these possibilities could eventually become a reality. So I ask you to release your imagination of 
the constraints of white supremacy and ableism and all these systems that try to limit your ability and to just imagine um, what schools would look like if they were more respectful and welcoming to students with disabilities and others. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was very, yeah, Nathan said, agreed. So we would like people to feel in, feel free. You can feel it more than once um, as you brainstorm within yourself and, and have more ideas to share. I forgot to say that we are spending about 10 minutes on this, so please. Yeah, that's the... Dr. Zafakar, can you share the um, Jamboard on the chat again, please? Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, where is the... Okay. Yeah. There's Thanks. Salila. Did... Yeah.
Matthew, um, do you want somebody to write this for you? What do you put on the, no, on no, the no, chat no, box? No, no, no. Okay. No, 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 no. I wanted to know if I can chat, you know. If okay. I can talk about my experience with this too as well. Because oh, okay. I used to be in a school system that also, you know, that's, uh, has a issues even now. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. We will we will come back. We will come to you. Like we will open the floor very soon. I was wondering, okay. you put it there. Uh, so are these words that are in the chat board on the jam board already? It's Did you carry, write them? I know. <laughs> Did you write them yeah, on the yeah. jam? Okay, thank you. Yeah, it's all periods. It's in my cell phone. Don't, don't, it's, I don't know how to turn that feature off. You're, you're not the only one that knows it. Thank you very much. A lot of people <laughs> know it's this. I can't turn it off. Okay, thank you. Well, I can see um, more are coming. Should we, should we give some more minutes for that? And I would also just like to alert people that there is a second page. Um, so the people who uh, want to add more. Oh, never mind. yeah. Thank I you. forgot that it was a second prompt. <laughs> I can add another page. Um, just give me a sec. And then on the third slide is, um, yeah, so the second slide is now empty for folks that want to continue the first prompt. So there are some things um, sent to the chat box. Um, Hannah said, in my school, I take a class called Beyond the Gym, which is basically personalized P. It's great, but I don't see people with physical disability represented in athletics. And I have to tell my teacher that I need accommodation. Yeah, thank you for sharing that, Hannah. Would you like to please add it to the Jamboard? That would be great. 
at this point, anything that you like to put in the in the chat box should go to the board so that we can collect it. But if you you want us to write it for you, please let me know so that I can do that. Okay, I think we can continue the jump board um, as much as we can. Looking at time, or uh, what do you say, folks? Should we give more time? Because I can see there. I can also say that this jam board can be open past the time that this. Okay event is over if folks would mm. like to continue adding their ideas. Yeah. That's great. Yeah, that's helpful. Thank you so much. So please continue writing and adding more because we want to have um, a great booklet, especially that we will use uh, or you can have as a resource after this. Yeah, so to Back to our program or our agenda, um, we would like to call some or uh, throw in the question now for um, your own contribution to the audience. We would like to hear from you, especially some of the things that you heard from our panelists that you connect with or you res that resonates with you, uh, talking about disability and our school system. What is that that aligns with you easily? We want to hear from the audience what you can share with us in line with education. Thank you. So now the floor is open. The floor is open. May I speak? <laughs> yeah, feel free, Matthew. Okay, let me see if I can get this work. Hello, everyone. Uh, yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, for me, as you know, with the way Vermont school system is, it needs more transparency. Like I put in the chat, it needs to be more transparent for people with disabilities. Like myself, when I was young, my town pretty much did not even have an IEP. It did not even have 504. And we're still and we're still trying to figure out ways to help students, children, teachers, professors with disabilities. You know how can we accommodate them in a way that you know that's more transparent? Because for me, as you know, with my life and continue to live with, as you know, I bring the issues up not toward just the schools. I bring, see the outcome for Vermont as a whole. And uh, for me, it's, you know, the advocate. I'm a self-advocate. But I advocate not just on one side of the spectrum. I advocate for all. And sometimes this may not even be a Vermont statewide. It could be a national. I'm a national player, too, as well. Because I see this as a whole broader scope of things around these issues that not only affect us as people with disabilities, but affect us as a community too as well. So if one community is hurting, everybody's hurting. And to me, to look past that and to move forward is to speak up. Speak up loud. Let your voices be heard. Because when your voice is heard, it get noticed. And once you get noticed, there's actions will be happening. It takes actions and it will work. For me, it's just, you know, I see the whole broader scope. I see issues. I see people's feelings, children, adults, seniors. I see what it goes through every day. I, I see it very clearly. And the clear, and for me, for the main reason that I like to move forward about this is just one, just one, one sense. Nothing about us without us. We probably heard that more, but it's now being heard more often because people with disabilities have these issues 
that are still not being met to this day. And we gotta move forward with them in a meaningful, transparent way. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. I have to just tell you that there were so many um, hands up for you um, in the chat box. Um, yeah, Nathan said, that's right, and, and amazing, Matthew, good job. Uh, Jacob said, uh, yes. Susan also, that was awesome. So thank you for sharing um, your experience. We would like to hear more from the audience, especially those of you who have been on IEP. We want to tackle issues that, or pressing issues that you are facing, or even if you are not the one facing it, your friend or somebody, your, 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 your neighbor. We just want to make sure that we tackle those issues on policy level. Yeah. I know I'm a panelist, but just quickly speaking of IEPs, it is mm -hmm. so hard in Vermont to be able to get on an IEP plan. <laughs> and the specific state standards are so, so different than all other states. And like, I, I mean, in, in every other state <laughs> that I've ever gotten medical care, they have always assume that I've been on an IEP and always said you need to be on an IEP and every time I'm like nope I'm still on a five, 504 so it's just like really interesting to me how mm. even even in services that are supposed to make things more accessible how inaccessible it is to get accessible services <laughs> yeah Thank you for sharing that. It's also very interesting as I work around the state with students on IEP, it stood out very clearly that not all the students with uh, a student on IEP or 504 actually know that they have a disability. That is one strong thing that we have to work towards in terms of self-advocacy because they know, for instance, somebody knows he has dyslexia, he has autism, or whatever it is that leads to be on IEP, all that he or she knows is he's been pulled out from the class, but it doesn't actually know that it's a, it's a type of disability. So when I meet them and try to um, work with them in terms of self-advocacy so that they can change the things that are killing them or to make sure that they have the self-confidence, they turn back and ask me, did you mean that if I have dyslexia, that means I have a disability, which is a great piece for us to really work on in terms of ownership of disability and acceptance. So that is one thing that I want to uh, throw out there. Um, Nate, would you, yeah, would you like to share your experience also? I certainly can. I do want to point out we have a couple of people who have their hands up on the screen. So I think, I think uh, oh. Hannah, Hannah and um, Krista should go first and then Helena and then I can go. I don't know if you can see them because there's probably so many people. Oh. But there's a couple of people with their hands. Let raised. me go there. Yeah, I was reading the chat, but oh yeah. So yeah, Hannah, please share your story. Thank you for that, Nate. <laughs> um, my camera is probably going to be weird. I'm sorry. Um. So I'll just keep it off um, because it's weird. Um, but I'm Hannah. I am a student at Mount Abe. Um, I'm a freshman in high school, and I use she, her pronouns. Um, I also have cerebral palsy. Um, and if any of you know Mount Abe, you probably know that it's a really old school. Um, I have friends' parents who went there, and they say that it looks exactly the same because it is very old. And that means it hasn't really been renovated. And so we had to, when I came as a seventh grader, I had to like have a lot of meetings about like, oh, I need like buttons on the doors and really simple things like that. Um, and also what I was saying about my 
gym class having to like take this class that's like um personalized PE but I don't see like people like myself represented in athletics all the time so I'm learning like I'm learning an able-bodied version of like oh this is what you need to do to be healthy and this is what is like considered healthy and all of that stuff um so that's a little bit frustrating but I think I would love to see in the future like more buildings that are like universally designed not just like accessible but buildings that are designed for everybody um because like curb cuts are great for people like me but they also are great for everybody um and it makes people with disabilities feel less like alienated when they need to use the elevator or like go up a ramp because everybody um would use that um and yeah, I think it's just really important. I am so thankful that these things are happening and people care enough to listen. And um, I think we have a long way to go, but I'm really thankful um, for things like this, um, where there's lots of people who are listening and advocating. And yeah, thank you. Thank you, Hannah. Can you show your face a little? I just want to see you. Hannah is one of my favorite students that I meet on one on one basis, and she's so smart. Can you just show your smile to to us? Okay, that's Hannah. Thank you so much for sharing that, Hannah. You are a great advocate. Yeah. Uh, the next person uh, whose hand is up is Helena. Please, Helena, you, are, you have the mic now. Hey, um, I'm Helena King. So I'm a peer advocate counselor at VCIL. And I just sort of sharing a little backstory of what my disability is. So I have seizures of seizure disorder, and also I have a learning disability, which is math-based. And I just want to say that it's so, it's just so wonderful hearing all of you guys speak today. Thank you so much. And I definitely hear on a different, on a different level, I think we're, we're all in the same boat, just different lifeboats in a way. It's an interesting way of putting it. But um, I just, I really just want to say that uh, there really are these issues of discrimination, stigmatization in our schools these days. Like thinking about it, I know that I graduated several years ago from high school and a few years ago from college. And I'm not sure how much it's like really changed since then, probably significantly and everything, but I think there is still that issue of discrimination within the schools, unfortunately, and needs to, really needs to stop. And I remember being on an IEP 504 plan um, and feeling, and sometimes feeling like, because of my particular barriers, my particular disability, I was unable to do certain classes like that I really was interested in because I was told it just, uh, you'd struggle in it because of your learning disability, your dyscalculia, which is math-based learning disability that I have. And I'm someone who likes, who's interested in math and uh, I'm not really sure where I was going with the story, but I just, I really feel, I feel what you're all feeling. <laughs> I understand it. And I think there's a, we need a, a major change for the better, more action, less division, and less, yeah, division. But I'm sure I'll, I'll say more in a little bit, but thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. If I should ask you a very uh, uh, follow-up question, yes. because one thing that I meet along the line with a student, especially those who don't have visible disability, you have invisible one. What, yeah. are, what are some of the the things that uh, 
you will connect with when we mention the word invisible disability, because when you get to some places, they will not believe you looking at you physically. What, what, what I want you to talk to that, that piece of it, that people look at you and you say you have a disability and they doubt you. It's interesting. And thank you for bringing, asking that, of course. Um, it is interesting. I do have a, an invisible disability, but also in a way it can be very physical too. Like not necessarily all the time, but when you do have a seizure, when you're learning and then it's like, oh, I don't understand how to do such and such or whatever. It can be very challenging at times. Very, very challenging, I'll say. Like, even though mine is invisible, you can't see it physically all the time. I remember when I was in school, it was a real challenge. Like I was, I always did, I did my best in school because I wanted to, and I knew I was there to do well, but like, it was always, I would say it was, it could be really challenging at times, even though I can't see it. Actually, could you re kind of re-say the question again? Because that was like excellent, that question you were asking me, Seth Gore. So yeah, did I sum it up all right? Or yeah, that's that's okay. Yeah, because I meet that uh, most of and some of the students uh, draw my attention to the fact that we we always project the the physical disability or the visible disability. But those of us who have invisible disability, we have this hurdle to climb or to go over, especially when you get to some places and you want to just admit that, yes, I have a disability and they doubt you not mm -hmm. having a disability. Yeah, so thank you for sharing that. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you too. Yeah, somebody actually said, um, said that we should have or we need to have a helpline so that students can get help dealing with discrimination and abuse. Yeah, that is one of the points somebody sent out. That's Benny sent out, yeah. Um, the next person that would like to share is Alex. Can you guys hear me okay? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. You want to sit, yeah. Yeah, I, my camera's not working for some reason. Good evening, all. My name is Alexander Rivera, and I have the privilege of serving as the chairman of the for, of the um, Hillsborough County Disability um, um, Board. Um, so, I began my journey um, when I was diagnosed with a very rare form of a throat problem, meaning I couldn't digest food regularly. And what would happen is, is that, you know, I would be, you know, if I were to eat, I would, you know, start to choke and cough. And, but it just really started to make me upset because I couldn't eat like everyone else. And I got bullied a lot. And, you know, they used to tell me that, oh, it, it's the joker or it's the, you know, it was just really hurtful. So I said to my family, I said, I don't think it's right that they're doing this to me. I mean, I speak normal like everyone else, but I don't eat like everyone else. About the time I was uh, four, I had uh, surgery and it was just a, it was a long battle to recovery. I must say it took me from the time I was four to the time I was eight to become fully recovered from that. And during that time, my family was the most supportive. And then when I began my middle school career, um, I instantly knew that I was destined to become a disability advocate, uh, SEFCOR. And um, that's when I first really started to become, you know, this passionate advocate for disability. I attend almost every single round table a discussion that involves disability. I um, I do apologize for my tardiness. I was in a I was in a uh, ADA meeting where we were discussing you know different viewpoints on you know disability. And then um, now that I'm the chair of a uh, disability task force, it's really an honor to speak about uh, disability and open you know the minds of the people who don't have a voice. And you Thank know. You. I just want to say thank you from the bottom of my heart, Seth Core. If I should ask you, Alice, how old are you? Uh, 15. 
Okay, thank you for sharing that. Yeah, thank you for, I know you are a great advocate, one of the students. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, Nate, would you like to share your journey um, in terms of advocacy, the importance of advocacy? As much as uh, we heard Alex, how advocacy has been for him as a student, there are more of my students who are really in need to hear from some of us. Yeah. Um, sure. Yeah. I mean, I can talk about my journey a little bit. It's a, it's a little, it's a little different than some other people um, because I have a physical disability and I was not disabled um, when I was born. I, um, I was able-bodied. I did not have a disability until I was 14 years old when I was in an accident um, and I got sick and that put me um, in a wheelchair and I had prosthetic um, arms. And I went to Mount Mansfield University, which was almost in terms of physical accessibility in a good way because it was all one floor. So physically accessibility wasn't really an issue. Um, uh, there are definitely some struggles. My real struggle was socially um, and accepting, uh, people accepting me. I found um, as a student, a lot of people, kids who I hung out with were kind of afraid of me. Um, it was very isolating. I thought that I was shy, I didn't know how to approach. And I also found that my teachers seemed to, a lot, many of my teachers seemed to associate that because I had a physical disability, I also had a learning or developmental disability. And I often found that they would talk down to me. They would almost seem like it was simplified and some were almost condescending and being almost amazed that I would participate or, you know, would write a good answer. Um, and in a way that gave me a bit of a chip on my shoulder because I always felt the way that, because, um, you know, the teachers and stuff kind of felt like they expected me not to do well. It gave me a chip on my shoulder to overachieve. So I think in a way I was always that kid who was sitting in the front of the classroom, raising his hand, talking and doing things because I felt that I had to prove that I was just as smart and just as able to be there as other students. Um, and so in some way, I think it helped me become an become advocate because looking at people's attitudes kind of made me say, well, you know what, if you think of that, I'm gonna, I'm gonna prove you wrong. But it doesn't change the fact that what they were doing was wrong. They, they, were, they were associating, they were grouping my disability with what maybe other people's disability and they weren't looking at me as an individual. Um, so that was really the biggest issues I had. And, um, I, I was, I was injured. I became disabled in 1990 where if, does anybody know the significance of that year? That was the year the American Disabilities Act was passed. So I really, um, yeah, I really got to, um, watch as accessibility grew and laws grew and things changed and many things changed for the better. And as I moved to college and as I moved to graduate school, I was able to help advocate to make those changes to see those changes happen. Um, so, um, you know, advocating to make sure I went to St. Michael's College for college and I really helped advocate to make sure there were automatic doors. Um, but the interesting thing is through college and grad school, the last thing I wanted to do was be an advocate. Um, I like math, I like that stuff, so I wanted to do business stuff. And I really wanted to really, in a sense, prove I was like everybody else. I wanted to do stuff and just not really, you know, make my disability an issue. Um, but then when I was at work, um, I got injured and I got re-disabled. I, I had to leave work as a disability. And I just, once again, I noticed um, that there were a lot of things still going on. And this is... 10, 11 years ago, which has been about 20 years ago after the ADA was passed. And there were still glaring issues coming up um, that I found myself having to be part of meetings and doing, doing uh, participating and sharing my knowledge of what my experiences with other people. And um, I really took that turn from when I came back for me to go back to work. I said, I want to be an advocate because I really want to I feel I have a lot to give my voice to people um, and give my voice and share my experiences with some of the things that I've seen. So my journey in school is a little different. Um, I think, you know, it's not right, but we learn from what we go through and we 
gain our experiences and we we need to be vocal. And I and one thing I wish I was a little bit more vocal about um, what happened because for me it was more, I'm just gonna prove you wrong rather than saying, you know, this is wrong. Um, so that, that was some of the experiences I had. Thank you so much, Nate. Uh, Susan actually put in the chat box that 1980 was also the year IDA uh, was uh, reauthorized and highlighted the significance of inclusion. The fact that many of you are sharing stories of being excluded today is frustrating. Yeah. Thank you, Susan. That's true. I saw two hands again. Salilo, uh, one, you will go. Then the next person after Salilo is Helena. Yeah. I just was really like struck by what Nathan said and also what um, was said in the chat about there being um, a hotline. And I think it's just reinforced like how traumatizing it is to be ostracized for having a disability. And I'm, I feel uh, really lucky in the fact that my middle school experience wasn't socially traumatizing because I had a classroom that um, was with me since first grade and that learned to accept me and my differences at a very young age. But what always kind of made me a little bit saddened was that it wasn't necessarily because they understood how like me being deaf like enriched my experience and made me different but that it was like in spite of me being that and that as soon as that I, and, and that I couldn't be um both accepted and be deaf is that I had they had to forget that was a part of me in order to accept me and I it just makes me really saddened how just just how horrible it, it feels to be like ostracized in that environment and I was having an experience like earlier this month with one of my teachers like not even just a student like a teacher who was like straight up harassing me in front of the entire class and like making fun of the way how it took me like longer to process things because I couldn't hear him and how I would need to like stare at him in order to like try to figure out what he was saying. And it was just, I don't know. It just what Nathan said really s struck me like how I, I don't even know what to say. It's just like how Thank very much for sharing that. Yeah, at times the teachers are supposed to know best, but I can assure you they frustrate us most. So thank you for actually touching me on that. Helena? I'm feeling so moved right now. Thank you guys. Those were incredible stories. And it's uh, just, just hearing these stories, it's kind of make it's making me think back to my experience I know like I'm I'm out of school and I've finished like I'm a I'm 27 years old right now like I've had my disability since since I was an infant pretty much so the seizures and the learning disability and just hearing hearing all of your stories is like really resonating with me so much because I know for so many years, it felt like I, I felt that I also felt, even though I think I had a pretty strong and supportive, very supportive family and pretty solid back group to a network to help out. Um, there was always a feeling of, I know for me that it felt like I was kind of a lone wolf and just going about it on my own and not really sure how to deal with the seizures, how to deal with my learning disability, because it could get so frustrating all the time. But I think kind of speaking on like, going on to the whole advocacy side of it and like sort of what inspired me to become more of an advocate and to 
find my voice is that I knew for, I felt for a very long time, like my voice counts, even though for, <laughs> even though it felt like for a very long time that it didn't. And which is really unfortunate because it still feels like that these days sometimes, not just for me, but for, I think for all of us in many ways, like all of us who are dealing with something or going through a barrier of some form, some form or another. And uh, we want to speak up and it takes so long to find your voice in the crowd at times. And I think for me, I'm even still figuring, <laughs> I'm still finding my own within the field of advocacy, but I would say, I think with my, I know I'm rambling a bit, but um, I know that with uh, the disability and everything, for years before I became a professional in the human services field, I think it was, it really was my disability and just experience that was like, it really made me want to just go above and beyond, and become, oh. just be the best version of myself I could be and in a way it kind of also be like yeah I can do this like, I got this in me and I really I my voice matters just as much as the other person's voice and don't don't hold back like really go for it because we all have important things to say and I feel very fortunate to be where I am and who I am and how I am these days so no regrets. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing that. That is so much empowering, especially to the youth who are, are listening to you uh, and knowing very well that it's a struggle whether to self-advocate or not. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. Ron actually uh, shared in the chat box that I can sympathize with Nate's situation with my hearing disability. Many people assume I was deaf and dumb. Thank you for sharing that, uh, Ron. And um, Amanda also said, as I am dealing with my son's IP, I am so inspired to, to, to make sure that he has the tools. And thank you for, thank you all. Thank you for all you are doing. Thank you. Um, Ed just arrived and looking at time, I would like to give Ed a little bit of three to four minutes, uh, two to three minutes to share his story, especially um, around things that he thinks has to be done, done and done well now, because we listen to the youth, we are still, they are still facing the problems that have been there for so many years, which I really want Ed to tackle a little bit and see the way forward. As uh, when Nate was talking, he talked about 1990, and it's about a decade now, we are still having the same issue of inaccessible education, discrimination, what, 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 all the ableist, ableist uh, ideologies um, crumpling us down. So Ed, I would like you to tackle everything and, and give us some ways from grandpa. Everything in, in two minutes. Okay. Um, first, just to let people know, um, I was about 35 years old when I got injured and it left me with a um, uh, an injury to the nerves around my spine. So I didn't break my spinal cord, but it affects my, uh, in the same way I have what's called an incomplete quadriplegia. Um, and so I use a wheelchair to get around. And one thing that I will say, I can really relate to, to Nate's talking about how the biggest adaptation was social. After a couple of years of, of you know, serious physical therapy and all, um, what I found was, and, and another theme that people have mentioned, sort of low expectations, people would look at the person standing next to me and ask a question instead of talking directly to me. And I got into politics. Advocacy came on. Um, I really didn't know the disability community. And advocacy came in the form of, of folks looking to me as a politician to help with their issues. And some of that stuff made lights go on for me when I, when I realized a, a few really central things I would say. One, for a lot of folks with developmental disabilities that the future that they were looking at was so much brighter than the kids of my generation 
who were not even educated in the same school where I went to school um, as a child. And so there were some really, really hopeful things. Sefakor, you want me to look to the future. For me as a wheelchair user with a physical disability, the things that look the least challenging to me are physical access. I think we've made steady progress on that. We've got a long way to go in trains and planes and other kinds of areas. There are plenty of things that need work for physical access. But for me, I think the most central problems are attitudes towards disabilities who folks have already mentioned things like hidden disabilities. It's, you know, when I think about people with psychiatric disabilities, it's still fashionable and okay in the society to look down on those folks, to make fun of them and to make jokes about them and then to get serious and to blame things like gun violence across the board on, on people with psychiatric disabilities. So I would say that's one of our greatest challenges and is how do we understand people instead of judge people work with them and bring them into the into our whole the fold in in disability advocacy but in community uh, at large and in society at large and in other ways too i think there's still a lot of discrimination that needs to be faced with regards to folks with developmental disabilities people don't recognize cap, uh, capabilities and so people are often either not in the workplace or doing work that's below what their capabilities might be. So those would be some areas that I would point to. Uh, uh, and I don't think I held it within two minutes, but I tried. Thank you so much. Thank you. That is so much empowering for my people. Nathan, I can see you are there. Nathan and Skylar are very shy students that I have uh, when we are talking about uh, self-advocacy. See, I hope you had Nate, um, uh, Ed, and do you want to say something that two of you, I'm just putting on, on putting you on the spot, either Nathan or Skylar, any of you can talk, or both of you, have you learned something about self-advocacy and how you can come out? Yeah, Nathan. Are you talking to me? Yes, Nathan. Do you want to share something that yes. you like? Mm -hmm. I've learned that a lot of people from different backgrounds have been denied access of certain things and it's really sad and I think it should change because it's not right to discriminate based on what their like, personality is the background is it's not right we have to have it like more justiceable there has to be more justice between people who are from different backgrounds or from different personalities thank you so much for sharing that nita thank you so much i really appreciate it yeah skyla have you learned something today about self-advocacy um, I guess, you know, you should always just, I think the big part is just to be yourself and to, um, you know, just speak your mind and, um, yeah, I, I don't know. <laughs> That's like the, just the gist of it, but, um, yeah. yeah, I don't know, just, um, you know, not to not be afraid, like if you're struggling in certain um subjects in school to always just you know it's it doesn't hurt to ever you know ask for help so that's the big picture right there thank so, you welcome. thank you for talking even though i put you on the spot right <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> yes thank you so much uh we have about two minutes but i would like to acknowledge um the fact that this program was highly organized with my mom Mama Deb, I called her my mom because I can't function without her. That's the reality. Uh, 
having the disability for so many years and listening to uh, the youth today, Deborah, what do you have to say? Do we have some hope? Is there any hope for the future? I mean, based on what Ed has said, <laughs> uh, we, we really want to hear something from you before we close. Uh, thank you so much, Sifakor. Well, I feel a tremendous amount of joy from the power of people, the voices of the youth today. And to be honest with you, I wish more of the changes that they've been calling for had already happened and that they weren't still having to fight the same battles that we've fought over the years. But I feel like the creativity and innovation and the trust in themselves and the reaching out to each other, building a community, working together for change, we can we can do it. And we, we need each of your voices and it just moves me so much to be part of this discussion. It's just, um, I really appreciate it. And I don't think Sephacor is going to be able to keep me away from future meetings because I love hearing your stories, the work that you, all of you are doing. Thank you very much, Mo. Thank you so much. Yeah, so any final comment um, or word from the panelists, Grace, um, Jacob, Salilo, and anybody who wants to share anything before we leave? I would like to hear the final word or comment from any of you. Personally, I just really enjoyed this um, panel. Um, I think it's the best one we've had so far. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and I really enjoyed everybody's input. Um, uh, amazing work, everybody. <laughs> Thank you, Grace. Jacob, do you have any final word? This is nasty. Do you mind if I uh, speak? Yeah, speak. Mike, uh, Matthew? Yes. Within the disability community, there's also, uh, we can work on justice reforms, economy and social justice reforms, and police reforms. So we can better understand that this issues as also many other issues of, within the disability community. So there's not just one issue. There's a lot, a whole lot under there mm. that needs to be addressed moving forward. So we can uh, address them in a in a way that uh, we'll have policymakers and people in the legislative, you know, be able to under, understand and acknowledge that this is, these are some serious issues that need to be. That, that the state needs to move forward on because we can't get from point A, point B, or point C if, we, if we're always, you know, stop, stuck in, or stop in our tracks. And we need to move forward to address these issues. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any other comments from the panelists or from the audience? Um, yeah, I'd like to uh, say that um, I have been very surprised by some of the stories that have been told. I didn't know there was like so much injustice in the world. And I'm glad that I was like more educated about all this. Oh, th thank you so much, Jacob. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. It's a learning process for some of us too. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so, um, among the audience, I think among the panelists, we had all of them. Salilo, did you speak? Do you have any last word? Sure. Um, you are all amazing. <laughs> and you exist more than to just inspire able-bodied people <laughs> like you deserve success and love and don't settle for the bare minimum yeah thank you Salailu. thank you so much i would like to use this opportunity to thank vcdr again um for giving us this opportunity to have this panel discussion. A particular thank you to Alisa, Stephanie, Mama Dev, uh, those of all, uh, those, the, all of the panelists who helped to make this happen today. I am particularly so grateful because the day that I talk about, can we have a youth 
um, face in the Disability Awareness Day and it was approved, I can see that today is a dream come true. Thank you so much for all the words, your knowledge, your wisdom, and the time you shared with us. Thank you. And we will get back to you and call you for another day for such a discussion. Please have a nice day. Bye bye. Oh, sorry, our interpreters. I so much appreciate your energy. <laughs> Thank you so much for being with us. That is a great oversight. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Christine.